go ahead and get started. First off, I'm about a third of the way through the test, so it will be graded by the end of the week. Um, too early to say exactly how it's going. So far it looks bimodal like it usually does. Um, but we'll see how that all evens out. Um, so the first thing I want to do is, is talk about crazing. Uh, finish or getting into the in more detail and so what you see here is a, a movie that is um, it's, it's loaded up on the on Carmen and so um, at this particular website and I advise you to get very familiar with this movie um, as you'll see from last year's test I can take video or not video but I take a still right off this movie and pop it on a task and ask you questions about it so I'd spend some time looking at this um, and he speaks in a very Mantur, uh, English Mantur, Manchester accent. He's far more intelligent than the rest of us because of this accent. So um, put up with it. And uh, so is this like unofficial slash semi-official homework? It's not homework. It's just I know. I'm know not it. saying like semi-official homework. It's not really homework. It's just it's a study aid. But we're going to talk through it here today. All right. So you'll you'll hear about it quite a bit. So, let's see. Kinetics of stress crazing and fracture processes in injection molded polystyrene at different strain rates. Standard dumbbell test pieces, width 10 millimeters, thickness 3 millimeters, injection temperature 200 degrees centigrade, stress direction horizontal. Okay, so um, polystyrene, molecular weight, number average molecular weight 115,000, okay. And um, the direction of stress is horizontal. Uh, I suggest. I think this was made like 1958 or something like that. But it's a great movie. It's, there's all kinds of stuff in this movie that um, makes me think about trying to do it here in a lab someplace. But anyway, it's uh, a great resource. So I'll just go through it one at a time. So first is the very slow strain rate. Okay, but not not as slow as it could be, but relatively slow compared to some other strain rates you're about to see. Short time tensile tests at medium strain rates. Strain rate 0.2% per, per minute. At room temperature, the dumbbell shaped test pieces are strained up to breaking point. They consist of transparent polystyrene dulled on the reverse side. Direct. Okay, so it's usually transparent, they buff the back side so it looks white. All right, normally you wouldn't be able to see a whole lot here, but they've added to some buffing on the backside, which uh, makes some comments about why that was a bad idea. But anyway, so what you'll see is craze is showing up in the, the cross piece of this particular dog bone. Exactly below the specimen, an analog display informs about the actual tensile stress. At first, uniform deformation without any structural changes. That's elastic. We talked about that before. Crazy. And now we have the, the crazes showing up. All right, light goes in, it gets bounced around inside the craze, and it looks white to Other us crazes because follow light is being refracted in all directions. Alright, so I'm trying to sp speed this up. So this is because relatively of the slow. process initiated internal stress and molecular orientation distributions, the highly oriented material near the surface remains still uncrazed. So the crazes stop before they get to the edge of the dog bone. We'll talk more about that later. The chosen strain rate of only 0.2% per minute affects relatively low craze concentration. The brittle fracture will take place at a stress of 610 kilopond per square centimeter, that is 61 newton per square millimeter, just over the right end of the analog display. Okay. So crazes show up, and eventually it does break. All right. And so what you're talking about is this inhomogeneous strain, as they cause it. These crazes show up. This is not reversible. All right, these are physical structures that have come into existence and lengthened this dog bone. And eventually, the dog bone does fail. Okay, so let me get past this. So this, this is 0.5% uh, per minute. All right, so kind of the same deal, slightly. except However, more. However, the oriented surface material remains uncrazed. 
many more crazies. And they show up uh, paired sometimes, which is interesting. Again, the sample will break over the right end of the analog display. But now, at a fracture stress of about 670 kilopon per square centimeter, that is 67 newton per square millimeter. Huh. Any questions about that so far? We'll talk about what we're looking at here in a minute. Yes? Is it being like pulled apart like this? Yeah, it's being stressed in the horizontal direction. So think of it as the gauge length of a dog bone. So somewhere out there are the big old dumbbell sides of the dog bone. But this is, this is the gauge length, the, the skinny part of the dog bone. Strain rate, 1.5% per, per minute. All right, so this is much faster. A lot more craze is showing up in this context. All right, you can see it's almost white with craze. square millimeter, the crazes grow partially through the oriented regions near the surface. Which is significant. They weren't doing that before. But in the area near in the, the surface, the fracture shows significant plastic deformation. All right, so let's see. Have. The growth of crazes in the surface region can be observed at higher magnification and roughly... So what they're looking at is the edge of the dog bone, all right, before you saw those crazes stop and not go into the edge of the dog bone, here we're going to watch them go into triple it. Triple slow motion frequency. At first, the ends of crazes become dumbbell shaped. Dumbbell shaped. And then eventually... The crazes grow slightly into the highly oriented regions and finally penetrate them in places. Uh, that's kind of cool stuff. Right, the fracture initiating deformation processes in slow motion at about 140 to 1. On the left, the increasing craze concentration causes decreasing transparency and slight necking of the sample. Come on, hurry up. Fracture now takes place. Pow. Ductile right. fracture in the Flying everywhere. surface regions, brittle type fracture internally. All right, so. Impact tensile tests. Just look at this very briefly. Kinetics so. of stress crazing. Slow motion. So this is uh, what is called impact testing. There's an IZOD impact tester. Do we still have one of those in the department? I don't know. It's like a, it's like a hammer that swings and, and jams into the sample. All right, so this is very fast. This is not percent of anything. This is like bang, hit it with a hammer. Rate about 38, They're still one filming one at high speed so they can see this, even though it the happens very quickly. The pendulum impact velocity of 3.85 meters per second generates initial strain rates in the range of some 100,000 per cent per minute. So very fast compared to what we just formation internally. Here, the frame series of the... So you can see that they're not nice orderly lines that grow from one side. They, they show up everywhere because it's being strained so quickly at 100,000% per minute. And so that is obviously a very different situation. High-speed rotating mirror camera ends just before breaking. All right, so they stop it. Once more, the same scene. Okay, so we have talked about impact strength a number of times in this class. This is an example of impact strength. So it's a very fast process. You drop it on the floor, you hit it with a hammer. All right, this, is, this strain rate is not something that we could normally achieve inside of a load frame, unless you've got a very special load frame. And a further repetition. I don't know why. All right, so... Um, and then they, what they do is a much, I think, slower rate about 125,000 to one with repetition. Some moments before. All right. So this, this is just showing it falling apart, as as a consequence of this, of this, this impact strength. Ahead of the crack front, an area of strongly deformed material moves across the sample. And then the whole thing busts, and things go flying everywhere. Okay. By measurement, and then 17,000 with repetition. 
Extremely low strain rates are verified in creep tests. All right, so this is a relatively slow Repetition. test. We get one cracking is announced craze by only that one occurs craze. A crack that occurs at the craze. Remember, this Repetition. is very, very slow. After breaking, the Much right slower than what we saw at the very beginning. Shows slight necking. And then what I want to get to is this last one. Time lapse rate about 1 to 8,600 and 1 to 180. So with it's repetition. a 45-hour deformation, all right? After stress reduction of only 1.5 Newton per square millimeter, a microscopic craze does not occur. After a long period of homogeneous deformation shot at a fast motion rate of 8,600 to 1, not much to see here, but it is changing the motion rate shape. is reduced to 180 to 1, in order to get a better time resolution of deformation changes, starting with slight diminution of section. So you can see it's getting thinner. Instead All right, this of is that, that deformation process. After 44 hours under load in the middle of the specimen, there appears, after formation of shear bands, a clearly visible shearing strain. Okay, so we have the shear bands that I talked about before in class. All right, you're seeing that here. Uh, maybe not as clearly as what I talked about in class, but you can still see that. Those crosses basically run over it. And then there's this plastic deformation going on. And it's plastic deformation because it's so bloody slow. Why don't you see the creases in this, in this one? Creases? What are the creases? Why don't you see the creases? Because it's too slow. All right. And so when we talked about this last time with PVC, example of a really slow strain rate, it doesn't behave like a brittle material if you strain it slowly enough. And so what we're talking about here is the transition from crazing, which is kind of a brittle phenomenon, to something that is more a ductile phenomenon, if you give it enough time and don't ask the, the chains to move around very quickly. You see them plenty of time. You see this overall deformation where the dog bone thins very nicely. All right, no crazes are showing up. And then we get these shear bands. It leads to macroscopical necking to normal right. stress initiated. Okay, so this is sort of what we talked about before in the clock diagram. You've got this process of plastic deformation. We're doing damage to the microstructure of crystalline and amorphous components here, and the whole thing is thinning out. It's small failures, and finally, to the crack. All right. Any questions about all that? So, again, this is, uh, the link is on Carmen. You know, please have a look at this. Familiarize yourself with what you're seeing, especially the different rates involved. Um, and we will refer to this quite a bit. And as I said, you know, I can happily pull off one of these stills and pop it on the test and ask questions about it. All right. Any questions about what you're seeing here so far? Okay. So what are we just, what are we looking at here? And we're looking at crazing primarily. There's other plastic deformation which relates to the previous lecture, but we're talking about crazing. And obviously crazing is something that is more likely to happen with decent strain rates, not really painfully slow strain rates. And part of what characterizes this process is that it's driven by flaws in the system. All right, and this is where plastics uh, share a lot with ceramics and glasses and some intermetallics as well in that they behave like brittle materials and they follow the Griffith, Griffith criterion for brittle materials which you guys are familiar with you've heard the name Griffith before not a coach's name in this context but this is talking about brittle failure all right Griffith criterion and part of the Griffith criterion is that flaws are extremely important they act to concentrate stress and they cause material behavior at a very small point that is not characteristic of the rest of the sample. And so this requires defects. Uh, in many cases, they can be external. And this is because plastics are soft, rather to the scheme of things. And so you can just you know, touch the surface. And you may not be able to see it by the naked eye. But if you zoomed in on that surface with an SEM, you'd see a scratch or some other defect from the fact that you touched it, especially if you're using something relatively hard. And so this can be um, processing based. And so what often happens is you have different processes that go on in these process in these the injection molding that can change the, um, the surface morphology. And in particular, you can have die wall effects, which relates to the fact that 
when you just saw that video a minute ago, they, the, they shot these dog bones and they shot them in something that had metal walls. All right, those metal walls were not perfect. They had plenty of scratches on them. And so that polystyrene and this plastic spoon faithfully reproduced the scratches that were on those mold walls. All right, so right away you've characterized or generated a set of geometries which involves scratch morphologies, which are great stress concentrators. All right, so it's really hard to get away from this. Um, in most cases, we don't bother to try, but it is, it is a concern. This is why they have to stop the injection molding process every once in a while and go and, and machine the surfaces of these dyes to try to minimize the size of the defects that are in those walls. You can also get um, you know, scratches, for example, as I said, you, if you touch the surface with anything hard, you generate flaws, and then there's other use characteristics that may give rise to flaws as well, besides us touching the surface or whatever they're supposed to be doing. It may involve contact with hard objects, and so those will generate scratches. We also have solvents that can and play a, a, defi a definite role here. And uh, I guess you can think about it somewhat in, qu in quotes. So we talked about like dissolves like, all right, and that's certainly still important here. But what we can see in this context is things that aren't normally solvents, like water, all right, which normally doesn't do anything to plastics because it's at the surface and that surface is under a lot of stress and those chains are moving around, that water can act as sort of a plasticizer, at least on a very local scale, and allow these crazes to occur. Uh, and other contaminants can be things like oils, for example, finger oil is one. All right, so lots of things that can be on the surface of a plastic and act like a plasticizer that, where they're normally not a plasticizer, and a big part of that is because it's under stress. All right, so this is sort of beyond what we talked about before when like dissolves like. Uh, certainly those are also important here, but because of the presence of stress, all right, these, the range of things that can act like solvents increases dramatically. All right, so we can have internal flaws, which are less common, but can be difficult to avoid completely. Uh, normally, the injection molding community is not insane. They don't generate bubbles inside their, their melt. All right, there's a vacuum step to the extrusion process that pulls out any bubbles that might be present. Um, but you can, in some cases, get bubbles. Usually someone screwed up badly if there's a bubble inside of the plastic. More commonly, there are things called um, wrinkles is a crude word, weld lines, which is better, um, has to do with the fact that not everything is a solid piece of plastic with, with no holes in it. And in fact, that you've, you've seen examples of these very complex plastic objects which has lots of holes in it, uh, maybe scallops, some type of surface morphology. And when you generate a hole uh, deliberately, not just incidentally, what you do is you have a metal pin that runs through the mold, right? And the plastic goes around that pin and then reunites. And that ends up leaving a nice circular hole inside the plastic, which is maybe what you want. Or maybe a, uh, a place to put a screw in or something like that. And that's by design. But part of that process involves that plastic flow separating and then coming back together downstream from that, that pin or whatever it is that you've got in the mold. And so what happens is that plastic sees that pin, it cools in contact with that piece of metal, it gets split, and then comes around behind it. And then what you have to have happen, or you want to have happen, is those two polymer flows reunite, and all the polymer chains intermingle with each other. Okay, you, you just forced them to separate, now you want them to come back together. And in some cases they don't do that. Um, and so you can end up with chain chain orientations in which you end up with purely secondary bonding. And normally we say, yeah, well, okay, that's fine, but really that's, that's the weakest arrangement. What we want is polymer chains that cross over that interface. All right, so we have that covalent bonding to work on. If we have purely secondary bonding, that's a, a weak spot. And it can be you know, something you can only see in the SEM. These can be really tiny, but have very strong effects on properties if it's just secondary bonding alone. 
And so there are a variety of other injection molding defects. And then we also have, as I'll talk about in a minute, the fact that we have additives in the system. All right, so not everything is, is extruded polystyrene at 160. It's, it's everything else we put in it, all the colorants, all these solids that we mix in the system to make it look pretty. All right, those are not polymers. And so those can act as stress concentrators as well. And even worst case, uh, residual crystallinity itself can act as a defect and a stress concentrator. This is the analog to this is grains in uh, solid metals and ceramics. If you really do a great job with metals and ceramics and get rid of any potential uh, flaws or scratches or pores, you've still got the grain boundaries. Those are weak points in microstructure. And if you get rid of anything else, you still got to deal with the fact that the grains themselves are weak points. This is why we typically like small grain sizes in materials. So this is sort of the analog to that. All right, so crazing and fracture. All amorphous thermoplastics contain discontinuities of some kind or source. It's impossible to get away from them. Um, we can talk about thermosets at some other time, but um, there are similar issues there at work as well there, although crazing doesn't normally occur in thermosets. So these discontinuities allow for development of an internal hydrostatic stress under conditions of overall tensile loading. What is hydrostatic stress? What makes it hydrostatic? Any examples of, of structures under hydrostatic stress that you know, you know of? All right, submarines are a great example. All right, so you're down at some ungodly depth, and the pressure is very, very high from all directions. All right, that's a positive hydrostatic stress on the inside of that submarine. So it's just like surrounded by a stress field? It's a stress field from all directions, not just one direction. Normally we talk about dog bones stressed in one direction, but these are, these are sigmas that are coming from every direction. The inverse of that is if we send uh, the space station, that's under a lot of negative hydrostatic stresses because the volume, the vacuum on all sides of that space is, is going to pull on it. And if you let it, it will generate a negative hydrostatic stress inside that, that system. Okay, and so when these types of hydrostatic stresses are present, weird things happen, um, especially in submarines. But anyway, in this context, we're talking about a plastic that has a flaw in it. And so I've got this example of this amazing blue flaw, all right? And so what we've got in this context is something that is not a polymer. And so we know if we are applying some type of tensile load to the system, and I'm gonna, this is for real systems, and so normally we can only apply tensile loads in one direction. So this is in a load frame, all right? These stresses are all pointing up and down which is what we want, okay? And we know that these polymer chains, if given a chance, if it's a coil initially, that coil can have ends, all right? And as time goes by, those ends will get pulled in the direction of those tensile loads. And that's all good too. We, we know that's supposed to happen. You saw that dog bone a minute ago, at very slow strain rates. All those chains are getting pulled in that horizontal direction. And so this process continues as time goes by. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, let's see, if we have a polymer chain that is not pointed in that vertical direction, so I'm gonna give it a different color. Say it's just they're both, the ends are both pointed to the left here. All right, so those, those that chain, because it's not going in that direction, the vertical direction, that's a strong direction for that polymer chain, it's not getting aligned. So as time goes by, that guy can just sit there, all right, and not really do much of anything because the ends aren't being pulled on, okay? And so this is what happens with polymers. We know it's going to happen, but when we have this flaw present, we have this huge discontinuity in the system. Uh, what's going to happen to the polymer chain sitting on the surface of that flaw? Are they going to move? Uh, no, the flaw ties them down. The flaw ties them down. So if we've done our job correctly, whatever this flaw is, and think of it as colorants or something like that, 
that is going to intermingle really well with the polymer chains because that's what we set it up to do that. Um, and so those polymer chains are going to sit in the surface and they're not going to pay any attention to this, this tensile loading. They're bonded to that surface. And so what that means is we get in this localized region, we get a negative hydrostatic sigma sub H stress because those polymer chains, and let's go back to the blue, they're pulling out away from the flaw All right, in this local zone, very close to that flaw. You know, there's still a connection to this rest of this blue stuff that's trying to go up and down, but this is being pulled straight out away from it and generating that negative hydrostatic stress. Okay, why could this be important in the context of polymer chains moving around? They can move in any direction. What? They can move in any direction. They could potentially move in any direction. But so we have this, this concept that is important to us called free volume, right? And that's the space between the polymer chains. It makes it easier or makes it hard depending on how much of it we have. Hydrostatic stress is adding to that free volume. It's helping pull things apart. Again, it's in all directions. So all the polymer chains in that local region there are all being under uh, uh, applied, uh, all undergoing negative hydrostatic stress, which localizes itself as the space between the polymer chains going up. All right, does everyone agree with that? And so, as a result, some chains leading into this area can be aligned with the tensile component of the stress. And so what's happening is we're seeing, um, sticking with that, that color scheme, we're seeing polymer chains that align in that, with that stress and others that don't align. All right, and so those that align are going to form structures called fibrils. F-I-B-R-I-L-S, more of those other later. And then um, others do not align and collapse into the matrix. Remember that the hydrostatic stress is derived from the tensile stress, all right? But as part of that process, that hydrostatic stress starts to generate a flaw or a pore. Flaw slash pore, or in the, the parlance of crazing, they call these microvoids. Okay, so we're getting loading in the vertical direction and so things open up in response to that loading in the vertical direction but the key aspect of this that causes this to open up is because there's hydrostatic stress and so that allows chains to move in all directions all right and that's catalyzed by the hydrostatic stress which greatly ramps up the free volume in the system and so that makes this process possible without the flaw we wouldn't have the hydrostatic stress and we wouldn't generate these voids in the system all right, which refract light and make that white color that you saw in the video at the very beginning. Okay, so light goes through this, there's refraction at the interface when it changes phase from one solid to another, and that causes scattering in all directions, and that's why they look white to our eyes. Any questions about that so far? All right, so key though is the hydrostatic stress and how it interacts with free volume. Any questions about that? Okay, so hydrostatic stress promotes chain rearrangement. And so what we've got going on here is these guys, sticking with that color scheme, are the ones that weren't pointing in the vertical direction. So they just kind of go and end up on the wall of the void because they're not being strained in any way. On the other hand, these ones have become aligned 
and have made these fibrils again. And this is all happening in the neighborhood of that flaw. All right, but now we have this microvoid. And you can see it's gotten bigger. All right, so this also um, illustrates the importance of carbon-carbon binding and the fact that it's a strong direction in these polymer chain systems. So it's not behaving like a metal or ceramic wood at this interface. This is the consequence of macromolecular matter. Metals and ceramics don't do this because they don't have that form. So we get some net, very small deformation about the interface. And so when that microvoid opens up, we generate a little bit of strain associated with the existence of that microvoid. And so the dog bone gets longer in the direction perpendicular to the craze itself. Okay? And then we have these oriented polymer fibril fibrils that bear load more efficiently than the rest of the polymer matrix. All right, remember these chains, carbon-carbon bonds are the same ones that are found in diamond, okay? So these are pretty strong. We talked about orientation in the last class too as well. So this is an example of orientation at work. And these work hardened fibrils transfer load to the rest of the polymer matrix. And so we borrow this term from metallurgy. We talk about work hardening. There are no dislocations anywhere in this structure, okay? so separate that from your mind, but it, it has the same type of effect. That, that material becomes much harder. Okay. And so, these microvoids propagate at right angles to the stress and they shoot out. Over here is that original flaw and it generated hydrostatic stress at its surface and that caused this, this whole process to begin. So this is what you saw in the context. Yes? Um, how many fibrils tend to make up like one crazy line? Is there like a general ballpark of numbers? Thousands, okay. millions, okay. These things are very small, all right? And we saw in that video, we saw a little bit of white color, which was the first few of those microvoids. And then as it spread out, it's a three-dimensional thing, all right? These are many thousands of those individual microvoids in the context of what we're seeing in those videos. Any other questions? So these microvoids scatter light, according to physics, and are visible as a craze in a plastic. White light goes in, white light comes out, except instead of going in one direction, it goes in all directions. So our eyes see that as a, a white, bright object. Any other questions? Again, flaw, hydrostatic stress, free volume, change can move, and when they do, they start this process. Okay, so what we see by eye is just the, the end stages of what happens here at the very beginning. Make sense? All right, and so what are these things and how do they differ from what we're used to thinking about? Um, first off, Craze is run from 50 to 90% void space by volume. It's not 100%. All right. This is not a crack. A crack, if you guys recall, has got nothing in between those two interfaces. All right. This has fibrils in between those two interfaces. And so, um, just look at that in more detail. So, if we have over here, say we have. say this is glass and we have this crack and that crack is trying to propagate in through that solid all right it works very efficiently in a glass because glass is a true grip of solid it's got no toughening mechanisms whatsoever in that and also that crack tip is atomically thin as well if we instead have yeah, let me go back to that. We instead have a metal, and this is an important digression. This is a metal. We have at the tip of that crack 
something called a process zone. What's happening in that process zone? You guys seen this discussion before for metals? So we have all this macroscopic strain. Somewhere out there, there's sigma sub t again. All right, pulling on this thing, trying to open it up. What's happening at the process zone in a metal? Doesn't happen in ceramics, which is why they're so brittle. But in a metal, what, what's going on? What, what is there? What are, there's a whole bunch of stuff at that process zone. What is it? Yeah. Is it stress concentration and then it's plastic deformation? Plastic deformation driven by tons of dislocations, all right? That's what metals do, all right? So this thing is crowded with dislocations. It's thousands of them in here, all right? And that's because all that stress is sliding dislocations around like crazy inside that process zone. Okay. So if we instead go from that to a polymer, change colors yet again to demonstrate that. All right, so we can have something that at least starts out as a crack. And again, we have a process zone. Um, but as part of that crack, eventually we start to get fibrils. And these fibrils bridge that crack. And they do it over increasingly shorter lengths as you move towards the process zone. And in the process zone itself, first off, do we have dislocations? No, no dislocations in here. But what we do have is hydrostatic stress. And as a consequence of the hydrostatic stress, we have polymer chains moving around and aligning themselves and generating all these fribbles. All right. So as we zoom out from that cartoon, uh, first off, we can see that eventually the fibrils do end, and then we have a true crack at that point. But within that area here, you've got you know 50 to 90 percent void volume, not 100 percent. But eventually they do fail. Okay, so eventually the, the fibrils will fracture as part failure occurs. And so two things. First off, this is an SCM picture of polycarbonate, which is a good example of this. Very strong, tough plastic. And what you're looking at here are crazes in this direction, as you can see. What's, what is the direction of the stress that's being applied to this piece of polycarbonate? It's sort of, sort of horizontal off at a little bit of an angle. All right, so it's going, you know, sigma sub t is applied in those directions. All right, so what that sigma did is it found a flaw, interacted with that flaw, generated head stress, the head stress nucleated a microvoid and fibril, and then that shot out away, all the way across this specimen. All right, so what we're looking at here is a whole bunch of tiny fibrils in there. And this is SCM. You know, we still can't see them. All right. They're really pretty tiny things in the scheme of things. And you can also see that examples of them stopping and starting. Your crazes start and then they stop. All right. And they can even follow these weird stress patterns that don't move in a straight line. And there are a lot of them as well. Eventually, however, they do break. And this is showing you that same sample this is the fracture surface. All right, so the triple form and they fracture. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but once you form those fibrils and they are broken, do you expect them to stay highly aligned? You do? So we've aligned the heck out of them. Suddenly we've taken the stress on it because that fibril has fractured. All right, so those guys are polymer chains and they hate being aligned. Why? Because it limits the number of configurations, doesn't let them maximize the randomness, and it gives them higher energy. So the first thing you do, the first thing that happens when you take all that load off, is they say, ah, oh, I'm gonna go back to being a blob. And that's what you're looking at here. It's a bunch of blobs sitting on the surface of that fractured polycarbonate. 
Okay, so entropy wins in this context. Entropy does not like the fact that, that, that these polymer chains were aligned inside those fibrils and it relaxes them back at room temperature. Okay, if you were able to do this, I guess if you were able to, if you were able to fracture it at zero degrees Kelvin and put it in the SEM at zero degrees Kelvin, then you'd see they'd all still be sticking off the surface. Other than that, they're going to collapse back into being blobs. All right. Hopefully that makes sense to you now. Any questions about this? All right, so these are not inorganic surfaces. Okay, so during the fracture process, crazing develops at the crack tip. And so we have this, this interface which has this crack tip and regenerating all these fribbles that bridge that crack tip. And they can get relatively well extended. And so during this process, craze formation absorbs energy in the system. And we consider it in the context of crack growth, we consider it part of R, or the resistance to crack growth. All right, so glasses don't, or, I'm sorry, inorganic glasses, uh, metallic glasses, crystalline metals, crystalline ceramics, they don't have any of this. Right. This is not part of the, 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 those structures because they don't have macromolecules. It'd be interesting if they did, um, but they don't. And so this is something that's much like fiber reinforced composites. Now you guys have seen this. If we take a uh, uh, ceramic matrix like alumina or um, a lot of metals in the same way, and you reinforce it with a fiber, all right, that fiber is there to bridge the crack and keep that those two interfaces from separating further. All right, so the fibers can toughen the metal or toughen the ceramic. Um, and in fact, you can get sliding. Uh, I guess that's one of the key differences is that with these composites, I'm talking about the inorganic ones, you want a weak interface between the fiber and the matrix around it so the fiber can slide and you chew up more energy in the system. Okay, this is totally different from that. All right, first off, it's, it's inherent to the structure. It shows up without having to put fibers into it. All right, and so what that's doing is increasing the toughness of our system, right? We like toughness. We like polymers to be tough because they don't shatter after they've been damaged. And then eventually there is fibril breakdown in the system. You know, they don't last forever, but even that absorbs more energy and also gives you more resistance to the process of fracture, all right? So plastics do this. If you give them time, as you saw in the video at the very beginning, they do this and it helps make them tougher and makes them what they are to us macroscopically, which is usually relatively tough materials. Okay, any questions about that? Have you, see, have you guys seen Griffith Criterion before? Yeah, okay, so it sounds familiar, all right. Okay, so along with that we have solvent effects. And uh, I mentioned one last time when I talked about uh, polystyrene dog bones, which are famously sensitive to the presence of acetone. And so you can get totally different behaviors. You open up a jar of acetone next to that, that polystyrene dog bone. Completely different materials. Virtually all thermoplastics in contact with organic liquid vapors fail the stresses of strains that are much lower than normal. And so this is because they become plasticized. And so plasticization consists of the polymer chains being able to move around more easily and this is happening not in the presence of uh, DEHP but instead in the presence of some type of, of simple organic liquid or vapor. And so that acetone molecule can get in there with the polystyrene, create some lots of free space, all right, free volume, and those chains can move around more easily and so the crazing process happens more easily as well. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Hydrogen stress helps crazing occur, and then you have hydrogen excess plus acetone, then it becomes even easier to cause crazes to develop, 
in these systems. And as I said at the very beginning, this is true, or toward the beginning, even if the liquid is not ordinarily solvent for that polymer. All right, water being a great example. I'm not saying it, it, it plasticizes every polymer, but there certainly are some polymers where water can suddenly start causes, causing crazes to occur when they shouldn't. Solvent acts to plasticize chain movement and allow for relative chain motion. Um, I mean, I guess if you wanted to, you know, the whole cartoon, squiggle cartoon, you know, we have, we can have a non-solvent getting in there and mixing it up with the polymer chains. And part of the reason why is because we have all that stress in the system. So there's a driving force for the molecule to go into the polymer chains and relieve the stress in the polymer chains. Okay. And this is something that we see um, in biomaterials applications as well. We have polymers that work great in the in vivo environment until you stress them and suddenly they start to de degrade very easily. That strain, that physical strain, changes the chemistry of the, of the polymer. And so suddenly they start to be more mobile. The effective glass transition is reduced. So this is the, one of the classic ways of looking at plasticization. They move around more easily at lower temperatures. And you can have failure or crazing initiated at whatever exposed surface is seeing those solvents, whether they're true solvents or even non-solvents for that particular polymer. Okay, any questions? All right, so a couple of good examples of this. So this is um, polystyrene again. Um, no, polystyrene is not the only thing that crazes. It's just the best example of crazing, so you see it a lot. So you see polystyrene alone plus stress, and you get some crazes showing up. This is under speci very specific conditions. But if we take that same polystyrene and we add butanol, which is a four carbon alcohol, which is absolutely not a solvent for polystyrene, all right? Butanol won't do anything to polystyrene but you apply that stress to it and you can see that the craze density becomes a lot higher in the presence of that, poly that butanol. And so that 4-chain alcohol is getting into the polystyrene, mixing it up, creating free volume where there shouldn't be any and causing this craze intensity to increase dramatically. And then we have this other weird effect in which we have polystyrene and butanol and no applied stress in the system, okay? And so this is, again, let me say applied stress. And what's actually happening here is you have residual stress at the surface. After injection molding. Okay, you probably have heard about this type of phenomenon before. If we injection mold our dog bone, all right, that polystyrene that's flowing into the, into the mold is getting cooled when it contacts that metal surface, but if there's a few millimeters of space, there's some polystyrene in the middle of there that is not getting cooled. All right, it, it solidifies later, and when that happens, it generates permanent tensile stresses at the surface. And so those can couple with the presence of the butanol and cause a bunch of crazing and sort of this, this brick-type pattern of cracks in the surface. Okay, so residual stresses occur in plastics relatively easily. Normally we ignore them. Uh, normally they're not a big deal, but under these very specific circumstances, they can show up and uh, obviously weaken that surface in the presence of this, this non-solvent for the polystyrene. Any questions about that? Okay. And then last but not least is electron microscopy. We'll see more of this next time, but um, this is just showing you a lot of different things. First off, these are our real fibrils as opposed to the little cartoon things I've been drawing. And this shows you a TEM micrograph of an active zone. Make sure we underline that word. Active zone at the Cray's bulk interface. The thickness of the active zone is in the range of 5 to 10 nanometers. All right, very, very thin. This is a 0 0.1 micron bar. And so this interface here is very really tiny. 
an active zone, what that means is, and you can't, you can't see this in the TEM, unfortunately, what's happening is you've got polymer chains that are being fed, all right? And so as these fibrils extend and get longer and longer, some of that happens internal to the fibril, but it's also dragging polymer chains out of the bulk material interface and into the fibrils themselves. And that's why they call it the active zone. You're actively pulling on the rope that is the polymer chain and adding it to the fibril. All right, that's where the phrase comes from because there's a lot going on at that interface. It's very active. We can't see it because it's amorphous, but there's a lot going on at that interface. Okay, that makes sense. And then something else that should make some sense is if we have these crazed microstructures for uh, 100,000 molecular weight, And then down here is 1.8 million molecular weight, all right? So one's about 18, the chain length of the other. And so you've got this, this one context, you have a certain characteristic length of fibrils in between these two interfaces. The active zone is still there. Polymer chains are coming in. Um, but if we instead take the same stresses and use a 1.8 million molecular weight uh, polystyrene in this context, the fibrils extend out for a lot farther, obviously. Why is that? Why would molecular weight or chain length make such a big difference? And yes? There's more polymer for it to be able to pull on, to be able to make it go farther. There's more polymer for it to be able to pull on? Like there's more chain, like more pieces of the chains for it to pull on. Higher molecular weight denser, means longer chains. Piece. They're longer chains. They're not really denser, though. No. Let's just let's assume that they're both fully amorphous. Yeah. Make it simpler. Yeah. We're looking for a part of it to be aligned rather than like if it's if it's grouped or something, and you have more sections that could possibly aligned in the stress area. Yeah, that's that's kind of getting there. So we have a, as part of that we have entanglement. All right, which is caused by the fact that these polymer chains interact with each other. All right, all that they loop over each other. All right, and the longer the chains get, the more entanglement you get. All right, so that means we're pulling on this stuff in the fibrils, and because the chains themselves are longer, the fibrils can end up longer. All right, and so this is something that uh, you need to keep in mind: is that you know, these fibrils. That's not just one polymer chain going from one side to the other. It could be any different polymer chains that are interacting and entangling and going all the way across the length of this thing. All right, And that process becomes more efficient when the chains themselves are bigger and longer. Does that make sense? All these different colors are supposed to be individual polymer chains making up the thermal. And if they're interfaces, they're, they're looping, they're entangling with each other. Okay, and so if they're shorter, then what can happen is those polymer chains can pull out. All right, so if this was, you know, that's 100,000, if it was 10,000, we might not get any crazing at all because the polymer chains would just unwind from each other and not really be entangled. We may just get ductal failure for a 10,000 molecular weight polymer, even though it's also polystyrene. Yes? So they entangle and then they get stretched easier because they're attached to each other. Yeah, they're, they're physically entangled with each other, yeah. But as a whole, they're being kind of stretched out. Like, it looks more uniform at the bottom of the top one. Uh, yeah, it's kind of an artifact. But yeah, I mean, these are, there's a higher density of fibrils here than there is there because they've been able to stretch further. Okay. So entanglement is very important here, and that's being governed by how long the polymer chains themselves are. Any other questions? All right, and then uh, some SEM data. We have um, SEM micrograph of stretched and broken fibrils of a cray zone at the crack tip in PVC. And so this is showing you what we talked about before. This is the actual crack, 0% you know, solid. And then we have the craze itself, which is this 50 to 90% void. 
but you can see hopefully lots of fibrils. And this is stretched, so they're 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 SEMing this under load, which is which is pretty sweet. All right. And then up there at the top, you've got all these broken fibrils, which are just blobs. So you can see that these, these things are actually three-dimensional structures that go off in all directions. And then, last but not least, I like this slide because it jumps around from polymers, so not everything is polystyrene. This is polyethylene, and this is showing you something similar to what we saw in the TEM, 140,000 molecular weight versus 70,000 molecular weight. You know, you're getting more stretching with the higher molecular weights, and that's because, as I said before, these are actually interlinked polymer chains, and they, they're more efficient at it when the molecular weight is higher than when the molecular weight is lower. All right, any questions about all that? All right, if not, I will see you guys on Wednesday.